Well, the pub rock circuit's getting a good deal of exposure of various kinds these days. And it really does make for an enjoyable evening to wander around to one of your locals, order a pure orange juice on the rocks, and listen to one of the very fine bands on the circuits. Well, hello. Today we're going to talk about the five most important bands of the pub rock scene of the 1970s and 80s. Of course, it's going to be very subjective, very controversial, and a lot of people are not going to agree with me, including you probably. First of all, it's got to be Dr. Feelgood. Now, Dr. Feelgood obviously came from South End, well, Canvey Island, let's not say South End, they came from Canvey Island. They stripped back the R&B, they put on a stage show that was punky. Wilco Johnson played his guitar in a particular way. Lee Brillo was an aggressive but charismatic frontman. The big figure on drums was pounding and menacing, and John Sparko on bass was solid, and he complimented Wilco, walking up and down and stuff, and it was the precursor of all the stuff that came punk. It shook up a lot of pub rock bands at the time, who realised that their style was not good enough, and that's why Dr. Hill got to, got to be number one in my list. One. And who's number two? Well, obviously, actually it's not really obviously, it's Kilburn and the High Roads. I ride, you ride. This was Ian Jury's band before Ian Jury and the Blockheads. Ian Jury used Kilburn and the High Roads as his sounding board. Playing in pubs in the 70s and 80s, particularly the 1970s, was a way of reaching your audience and trying things out when it didn't really matter. If you're playing in a pub in, I don't know, Kensington or Holloway Road or whatever, and there's 40, 50, 100 people in the audience, and you make a mistake and you get a song wrong or something, or your song doesn't go down very well, or your bit of chat falls flat, nobody really cares, because the next night you can go and you can do it better, and eventually you can build up your stage act, all the songs that Ian wrote for Ian Jury and the Blockheads came out of that period when he was working on lots of different things, not just in the music, but artistic things. So I'd say Kilburn the High Rose is number two in my list. So who's number three? Well, before we get to number three, can I just ask you to comment, let me know what you think. This is not all about me. I was there, yeah, sure. But even if you weren't there, or if you were, let me know what you think, because it's not all about me. And like, if you like it. If you don't like it, well, you know and subscribe. If you're not already a subscriber, now's the time. So who's number three? Well, it's a surprise no one to say Brinsley Schwartz. That she was meeting up with one of her friends. Oh, yeah, man. But it was nothing. Not because what people say, oh, they're the best pub rock band. They were good, don't get me wrong. They were great. They had a lot of talented people in it. Nick Lowe, obviously. I love the work only it can do. The front man was getting it all together. It was the precursor of the Stiff record scene. Dave Robinson, who was one of the two founders of Stiff, together with um, Andrew Jakeman, became Jake Riviera. Dave Robinson sort of helped to start Pub Rock. Pub Rock had a bit to do with Stiff Records. We, we met a lot of people who we thought were great, but there was no outlet for them in the recording point of view. So when we started Stiff, they're the people we approach. Let's go back to the beginning again. Pub rock was always a thing in London. Bands always played in London pubs. Let's get that straight. And it was a continuous thing, but in 1971, that sort of time, Dave Robinson, being Irish, was able to persuade certain pub landlords to put on rock music, and there was starting to be a market for it. Like, don't forget, if you can't have pub rock if there's not the venues, if there's not the bands to play the venues, and if there's not the audience to go and see it. It's got to be an organic growth. You can't have any one of those three without the other two. He was one of several people who saw a market. Other people who did were the guys at Albion Agency, were the people who booked the bands into the Red Cow, the Nashville, the Hope and Anchor, places like that. And Dave was partly involved with them. There's a guy called Ian Grant, there's a guy called Di Davis, and there's a guy called Derek Savage. They're all names that are mainly forgotten in the music world, but they were very influential at the time, as was Dave Robinson. So going back as we were, so this started talking about 
briefly, Schwartz, just to say that Dave Robinson was their manager. And I think part of the reason why there was this idea to get them was to find a place for the bands to play and to play to an audience. And that was all part of it. Niccolo, the front man, was sort of wasted in it, Bruce Schwartz, to be honest with you, because he was much more of a, a renaissance man. He wasn't just a front man for a band. He was, he turned out to be a producer. He wrote songs for people. But basically, Bridget Schwartz occupied not only a place, they were just right for the time, their vibe on stage was perfect. Surrender to the river that is calling him home. Like a, you know, like a smooth, right on kind of dope smoking band. But they managed to convert that into the stiff records, etc. The rest is history. That's why Bridget Schwartz are so important. So number four has got to be Eddie and the Hot Rods. Do a load of bands at the time, and I suppose equal fourth should be Eddie and the Hot Rods and the Stranglers, because they both sort of like came out of different areas, because the Stranglers was really called the Guildford Stranglers. And they were like playing the pub circuit in London, roughly the same time as Eddie and the Hot Rods. They were like a more, I don't know, more punky version of Dr. Feelgood in a way. Do anything you want to do. They were doing it harder, they are doing it rougher. They opened the way up for punk. Without Eddie and the Hot Rods, and to a lesser extent, perhaps the Stranglers, there wouldn't have been punk, I don't think. But there was, there was a high energy thing. You've got to bear in mind that the pub rock game at the time, um, people talk about bands like Scarecrow. You've probably forgotten about Scarecrow, but if you're around at the time, Scarecrow played every night of the week. They were like a band I used to avoid, frankly, because they're like a hard rock sort of band. Not my sort of thing at all. And they used to play a lot at the Bridge House, I seem to recall. I don't know, I was more into the punky stuff, actually. Even though punk hadn't actually started then, I was more into the Feel Goods and the Kilburn, the High Roads and the Ducks Deluxes, to talk about them, and the Bees Make Honey. Because that brings us on to number five, Bees Make Honey. Now, Bees Make Honey, at the time, were the archetypal pub rock band. <laughs> was led by a guy called Barry, who by day was an advertising executive. A lot of the guys in the band were Irish, they were from show bands. Bees Make Honey were a good time R&B band, and if you went out for a night out, you'd know you'd have a really good time. And they were really popular. I remember going to see them and they were, and it was packed. And they were the precursors of people like Juice and the Loose. And I think that Bees Make Honey are my fifth. And that's it, because I said five, and I've given you six, really, because the Stranglers snuck in there with Eddie and the Hot Rods. If you agree, comment, let me know what you think, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching, and um, goodbye.